Good afternoon. Welcome to Pottery at Home series. We're going to be making the Green Man today. Um, I was looking around the field the other day and I have to say that since we started isolation, the weather has changed, in, changed enormously. It was frightfully cold and I had a big hat and gloves on when I went for my first exercise. But now, when I go outside, I need my shorts on, it's so hot. And what's wonderful at this time of year is that everything is starting to grow. In particular, looking around the field, I noticed that the um, leaves on the oak tree were just beginning to start to, to come out. And in fact, I spent some time staring at the leaves as they were growing and, and marvelling at the different types of green that uh, were emerging. And in fact, as I was looking through the leaves, I saw all kinds of patterns and shapes. And that's what happens when we stare at things. We often see faces in wallpaper and faces in things that we don't expect to see. And I suppose that that's where the Green Man might have originated, because the Green Man is a sculpture of a man's face, but it's surrounded in leaves. It's a symbol of rebirth. And it seems really, really apt at this time of the year and especially under the present circumstances whereby we're reminded on a daily basis about death and it would be rather nice to think about rebirth as well. So here's a picture of the Green Man um, that I found. Um, the Green Man has been around for a very long time and it might, might be a good idea to research it. Um, I've created a booklet so that you can make the Green Man by watching the video and by looking through the step-by-step -step took hours to make booklet on what to do and in what order. To make the green man what you need first of all is a head shape so usually an oval will do, um, perhaps a circle, it depends on whether you're making something that um, is very face-like or whether it's stylized. And once you've chosen your shape then you need to create the foundation for the face. Um, so <clears throat> to begin with you're only really looking at the base of what's behind the eyes and the nose and the mouth. You're not really looking at the finished article. To begin with, I found something that I thought would be ideal for making a round face. Um, and even though it's a round shape, I can change it and elongate it a little bit later. It's a dish mold, so you'll learn how to make a dish as well during this. Um, I also found an oval shape, which is a, a hump mold. So let me talk you through how you go about using these. First of all, you need to roll a piece of clay out and as you recall, before you roll the clay out, you need to wedge it up and make sure that it's woken up and it's ready to go. Having wedged it up, then you need to find some guides. These guides or sticks, you can use your uh, placemats at home. Make sure that they are thick because this is going to go onto an outside wall in the garden. It's a stoneware piece of work. It will with stand frost if it has been fired to a high temperature with a um, specific stoneware glaze upon it. So these guides are actually one centimetre deep and that is the thickness you need for the foundation of your work. Start by rolling your clay out. As I roll it out, I turn it over. Make sure it is completely flat. Every time you pick it up, you stretch it so as it gets larger, when you pick it up, roll it on your rolling pin, lay it down, push it into itself and ensure it's completely flat like that. Once you've flattened it, you can use a kidney to smooth it before you make use of it. This will compress the clay and help to pull it back together because as you've rolled it, you've stretched it. The next thing you need is your mould. Now, if you haven't got a mould like this, then you can use something at home, you probably find something suitable in the cupboard, but it, the clay will stick to it. So you need to put a barrier between the clay and um, the vehicle that you're using, the vessel. I would suggest uh, some strips of newspaper dampened with water and placed inside the container or um, lots of people use cling film. Having said that, if you are having one of the pottery parcels, you'll find that there'll be a bowl like this in it, which you can use. The pottery uh, tools and equipment are all on loan. Put the clay over your rolling pin before you lift it. 
And just pop that on there to make it a bit easier. And then feed it into your bowl. You've probably got a cake stand, perhaps, or um, something that you could raise a piece of clay on, a box or whatever, so that it's a better height for you. So work your way around it like so. Now we've got a lot of clay that's sticking out over here. What I'm going to do is just rip that clay off because it's not going to be used and it's getting in the way, like so. The next thing I'm going to do is take a sponge and some water and sponge quickly into the bowl. It's already down, it's touching the base, but by gently sponging, I'm getting it that bit further. Having done that, if you've got one of these tools, you can cut, and you will in fact need to cut on that edge like that. However, you can manage simply with a knife. Just cut all this excess clay off here. And then trim back this way. And if you recall, we used guides, we used sticks that were a centimetre thick. And that means that the clay is quite thick in here. Um, and it means that this is going to be a face when it dries. This nice thick edge will be um, useful for um, sticking onto the back plate. If it was a thin edge, it would be flimsy. And if the clay was thinner, it would be difficult to sculpt into. Now, unfortunately, that's too soft to do anything with. So what we need to do is to leave it until it firms up a bit. I usually leave mine outside. Uh, not in direct sunlight because that, that dries the exterior of the clay and the interior remains soft. Um, but in shade outside or on a windy day, it dries very quickly or maybe in your room, um, wait a few hours uh, or use a hairdryer if you want to speed the process up. So, an hour ago, I made one of these and I placed it outside. And as you can see now, it will just pop out like that. And okay, it's not an oval, it's a round shape. I've done a rather stylized oak face, which um, is, is quite round, but I still want to make it a little bit oval down at the bottom for the chin. I must mention at this moment though, that if you have got a hump mould or you've seen a hump mould in the studio and you don't know how it works, um, clay is simply draped over the top uh, sponged down and then trimmed at the side and you might find you've got a shape that's really suitable at home that you could drape clay over. You then leave it to firm up just as we did with this bowl here. The problem is that because the clay shrinks as it dries, as it shrinks it will crack if you leave it on this mould. So you have to be very vigilant and make sure that you remove it um, as soon as it's slightly firm. To demonstrate to you how much clay shrinks, here is a dish I made on this hump mould earlier, and you can see that it's already a lot smaller. Had I have left it on here, it would have cracked, but I took it off and then completed the drying um, without the mould underneath. So that's a nice oval shape and you might have a hump that you can drape your clay over that's more suitable than something you put the clay into. If you're having a parcel, you will find one of these inside so you can use it. So you've got to look at this and not think dish, you've got to think face. So I'm wetting the surface. It's firmer but it's still got moisture in so I can still shape it a bit. And I'm going to shape it into more of an oval towards the base by pushing it in like that. I've got my hands wet and I'm striking it down. Um, and I'm thinking that that is kind of where the chin is going to be. And if I get a, a stick, the guide, I can now draw a line for the centre of the face. It's not very central that, so I'll redraw that. There you go. In fact, it was very off-centre. Okay. 
Um, having drawn the line for the centre of the face, the face is then divided up into thirds. So the eye to the top of the, the skull here, the forehead, is, is really a third of the whole size. This, this area here is really quite large. So by actually drawing a line a third of the way down, I'm getting what really is the eyebrow line. And then by drawing another line, another third of the way down, I'm getting a nose line. Onto those, I can now begin to sculpt the face. And to begin with, it looks very crude, but bear with it. It's a line for the eyebrows, a line for the nose, the coil, if you like, and then I do a ball for the nostril, a ball for the other nostril, and a little ball on the top, just to give the nose a bit of height. Right, let me move this down so that you can see it a bit more clearly. It's quite hard to work from behind it, but I'm just giving you the idea. Um, the eye needs to be a socket, so I'm rubbing the clay down each side. And all of these parts that I've put on, I need to sculpt into the background. Now, if you find that your, um, if you find that your face is collapsing at this point, that you, maybe your base plate isn't as hard as it should be, you could put some bubble wrap behind like that. Okay, so this is a point really where you need to be very thoughtful and have complete quiet, I always find, so that you can start to work all the clay in and think all the time that you're doing it, it's a face. Let me turn it around so I can see if it is a face because obviously I'm working upside down. Really work the eyes in. And you can see that that is just the beginning of the facial structure. But it's got a significant line for the eyebrows. It's got everything you need to sculpt the nose out of it. Um, and it's got sockets where the eye, eyes will go, okay? I did do one earlier. You can see that I've really smoothed in the nose and um, the eye socket is, is on this side, not filled, but on this side it is. And the mouth isn't done at all, but I'll show you how to do those. You need to have a little piece of clay that's um, a kind of oval shape, a cat's eye shape, I think, really. Um, and you need to score the back of it and put some slurry on. Because this has gone quite firm now, so you do need to uh, make sure you stick down well. And then what you've got is um, a platform for modelling. And what I do first, now you have to bear with me because it's upside down for me, um, is I take a knife and I cut the eye in half like this. Okay. And then I get my knife and I really open the eyelid up. Okay, and if you struggle with a knife to do that, you can always use a wooden tool. And I'm bringing the bottom of the oval down. I hope you can see that quite clearly. And the top of the oval up. If it's a little bit too big, this is a point that you can trim it back. And I think the biggest problem with doing faces is not actually modelling the eyes, um, or in fact the eyebrows, but getting symmetry, because both sides need to be the same, and if they're not the same, it will look strange. Now you can put your eye into the socket, a little bit of slurry, as we did before, pop the eye in. Um, and in fact, what I usually do when I'm making the eye is to make both eyes at the same time so that I know that both balls are exactly the same um, rather than make one and then try to work out, try to figure out exactly what size is the ball for that eye. Okay, and um, you know how you make 
the eye look it is up to you you could leave it at that or you could do what I've done on the other eye which is to put a tiny little pupil on top and that's very sticky so that's going to go on there so it's much bigger than this one but I could carve it back once the clay gets a bit firmer and get it the same size for the mouth you need a soft piece of clay which you roll into a line happy fellow um, and again all you're doing is creating a foundation that you can work with um, in fact this one is better for the there because we want to it's not really thick enough we want to have something that we can work into and with the second one you bend it up bend it down bend it up so that you've got kind of top lip and there we go you have something that you can start blending in and turning into lips okay so a lot of what you do when you're making a face is about putting down a foundation that you can then sculpt into and that really is all about observing observing so if you've got a photograph of a face anybody's face um, will do then you can start to um, begin to work out exactly what how the eyelid should go or, or how the mouth might go and create enough clay on the surface of your face to play with and don't forget the clay is very very soft it's hard to model it's very often a good idea to get your foundation on then just leave it and sculpt into it when it's gone a bit firmer here's a mouth i made earlier it's actually gone very hard so this is far too hard but as you can see um, you can play and play with different shape mouths and get the look that you want so those are two faces that um, are on their way getting there um, and here's a face that I've completely finished in terms of it hasn't got its oak leaves on but I'm quite happy with it you can see that the circle has become elongated there's a little bit of cheek that's coming out of it and um, it's quite stylized but I think it'll do now what you need is a back plate that is a piece of clay that you can put the face onto before you start doing the oak leaves so it's a good opportunity now to start rolling out some clay for your back plate and rolling out some clay for your oak leaves um, at the same time let's put them out of the way so you know how to roll out clay and here's a piece I rolled out earlier in fact in some ways you could roll it all out right in the beginning and then it'll be just the right firmness to join together. If you join soft clay and hard clay together, um, it will crack apart later because it's drying at different rates. So perhaps when you make the clay for the bowl, which is the base foundation, you should also make the clay for the back plate and roll out the clay for the lips. So here's my back plate that I've rolled out and you'll see that I have drawn um, a, a perimeter on it. The perimeter matches the face, in fact it's upside down, it matches the face shape. Put this this way around for you. Okay. And there's a random amount of clay around the exterior which I can work onto with the leaves. So what we need to do first of all is to mark where the face goes and then cut out some of the back plate. You don't need all of this weight in your work. Okay, so we'll get rid of that. Um, and this is a perfect opportunity. You can see that this has dried fairly firmly now. So I can lift it up and I can put a knife in here and wriggle it around and make a space for screws there's nothing worse than making a sculpture and then realizing you've got no way of fixing it to the wall done that a few times okay so the next thing to do is to score well where the face is going to go the scoring is really important 
when I worked in schools, children used to think, she'll never know if I haven't done that. And they used to push their work together. And then when it came out of the kiln, it will have all fallen apart. This is really, really important. Thorough, thorough scoring. And same again on the face. Really thorough scoring. There's moisture in this clay, it's very firm, but there's moisture in it. And because there's moisture in it, it is going to stick together. If it was so firm that it was difficult to cut into, that I couldn't feel that kind of sliminess as my knife cut through it, then it would be too late, really. I'd know it wasn't going to work. So, having done that, you need a good mixture of slurry, which is clay and water mixed together. And if you watch the video, the quick tip video on looking after clay, you'll learn all about the different stages of drying with clay and um, also how to make yourself a perfect slurry. Put plenty on, copious amount of slurry, and don't, you know, brush those score lines until you can't see them. Just dance the slurry over the top and place your face on top and give it a little wriggle. Ooh, my ball's wriggling. And that will create a suction. Okay. In fact, you can see, look, it's lifting up the back. That suction means it's very, very well stuck already. And then you will need soft clay. And you make yourself some sausages. You've probably seen this done before. Just seal all around the edge with a sponge. Get rid of all that sticky slurry because you want to put your coil on. And a coil is something that will add strength to any join in any piece of work that you do. So you always, always, always need a coil. You don't need to make them too big. You don't need to make them too little. And you do need to work all the way round. And once you've worked all the way round, you simply got to run your finger through the middle of the coil, pushing it into the seam of the clay, and then down. And if you've got clumsy fingers, then you can do this with a modeling tool like this. It's entirely up to you. There we go all the way round. And I now have a face which is fixed to a base and ready to decorate with oak leaves. And hopefully when you rolled out the clay for the back and for your bowl, you also rolled some clay out for leaves. Now if you're taking a parcel, you will find in that parcel templates of oak leaves. You don't have to do oak leaves. I suppose you could do any kind of leaves. And, and that's done. I'm happy with that. So far so good. Let's take a look at the leaves. Okay, so now we're going to address the oak leaves. As I explained, you will have an oak leaf shape in your um, pack. But um, oak leaves are such lovely shapes. They're sort of just very rounded. Um, and I just think they're one of the easier leaves to create. However, just in case you struggle with that, I have actually created some oak leaves for you. And what you need to do is to um, roll some clay out and then place your oak leaf pattern onto the clay. Now you can cut the oak leaf out straight away if you like, but I tend to leave my clay to just firm a little bit 
so that when I'm cutting it, the clay's not being dragged too much. You can cut with a pin easier than with a knife because you can get round the corners and you can take away the clay from the edge. It's a little bit like when you make cookies with pastry. If you try to pick out the cookie shape, it all gets misshapen. But if you pull away the pastry and you're left with all the cookie shapes, it's a lot easier. So make a large piece, put lots of leaves down, cut round them, and then finally take away the clay that surrounds them. And you can start. So I've got a few leaves that I cut out earlier. They're a little bit softer than that one. It's got a bit hot in here in our filming studio. Um, and what you need to do is to tidy them up. So you can start, if they're very, very firm, you can do this with a sponge quite easily. But if they're still rather soft, you have to go a little bit more carefully um, and use your fingers around the edges, like so. Then when you've done that, you need to take your thumb or your finger and press them into the rounded section of the edge of the leaves. And that really gives, really scoop back, really gives the leaves a bit of shape. Okay, you've got this sort of dent that's happening in this area here. The clay for the leaves is thick, not thin. Don't get that wrong. I didn't mention before, but you do need them to have be about five millimeters deep. Otherwise, they'll be really thin and more than likely they'll break when you um, start to work with them or they'll break when they've been fired. You need to take some plastic and place it over the top of your leaves. There's nothing that I hate more than scratched lines in work. They've got a really um, basic, crude look to them. If you use a pin, but you have a piece of plastic on your clay, when you put the marks in that you want, the veins of the leaves, they become rounded score lines rather than sharp, jagged edges. And basically, they just look a lot more natural. So you need to make yourself a lot of leaves. In fact, I think it's about 12. But of course, you don't have to follow my plan for adding leaves. Here, I have the face that we started. And essentially, there's a lot of symmetry going on in this piece. And I found it was best to place Look, I've decorated the wrong side. Um, a leaf at four corners. Like that. And in fact, this one's the wrong way around. I want it like that. But it doesn't really matter. You can play with the leaves. They can go under the nose. They can go beyond the nose like that. But I think if you play with this four-piece symmetry to begin with, then you can start to add in the other leaves in different places, like so. So how do you stick them on? First of all, what you need to do is to score the backs very well. Um, I've got a kidney which has got some scratchy shapes in it. I don't think I can find it here. I don't know what I did with it. Yes, here it is. It's a serrated edged kidney. And by scraping it over the, the leaves, I get a scored line, which is a lot quicker than scoring all the leaves. Then I can add the slurry to the back and don't miss any of the back out because the clay should be really a little bit firm. Look, this is not floppy, really quite firm. And then wherever you're going to have the leaf, you equally need to score. So I think you can see how important scoring is from this particular exercise today. That's going on there, like that, press it down. And press from the middle, so you're pushing all the air out. Again, you can see why it's important for the um, leaf to be firm, because otherwise you'd be pressing it on and losing the shape. So it really is really very, very firm indeed.
okay when you've done that you could take um, a sponge and sponge around the edges but actually I find that I've forgotten to put my water brush on here so I'll use my slurry brush I find by going round with um, a brush with a little bit of water on that that sort of lays it down nicely and of course you can always use your finger but make sure it's well sealed and looks pretty now you're going to have to work all the way around you're going to have to decorate all of your leaves and decide how you want them stuck on do not leave bits sticking up because they're going to get broken remember this is going to stay outside it's going to be you know, windy frosty cold birds land on it you don't want bits that stick up and then get snapped off you might even have a football thrown at it okay so work on all your leaves get them all on if you would like an acorn would finish it off so you'll also find a little mold for making an acorn this is a sprig and i did explain in another lesson how to make them but you'll get a sprig in your box too and all you need to do with your spray is get some soft clay, not too soft, place it into the mould and then prise it out and that will look like the base of an acorn because it is the base of an acorn that I've made the mould from simply by pushing it into clay into a block of clay and then firing it so all it needs now is a ball for the nut and when i was looking at the green men i just found that a lot of the designs had one or two acorns maybe three that can go on there like that, a bit of slurry, pop it on there like that and then you can put it in some strategic place on your green man and it will be the last touch, don't do it until you've absolutely finished. Another way of doing it, if you haven't got one of those moulds, is by simply making a ball and then taking a pencil or a round tool place that inside the ball like that and then if you can get something to texture that little basket um, maybe you've got an acorn lid itself something that's got sort of little bobbly patterns on that's another way of making a vessel for your nut very very similar without a sprig so it takes time to get this all joined together and um, it's just repetitive stick the leaf on secure it maybe paintbrush around it add the acorns when you finish doing all of it and only when you finish completely you can then cut out your exterior section your perimeter your edge like so and that's really the last job and that's you need to just firm that together you can see it's quite thick but it's going to have to withstand being placed on the wall so that's my finished um, green man let's take a look at one I did earlier it's already dried out it's ready to go in the kiln so it's changed color I also have on the board a picture um, a small one which one of the students hearing we were going to make green men decided to make one herself already so let me just not break it as I took it up this green man is made by Annie Annie B there you go Annie and it looks lovely well done there's quite a few variations on this theme and here's the one I did earlier this week which is now dried out 
It doesn't look half as exciting as it will do when it's got colour on and I can't wait to put a really vibrant green translucent colour. All of those undulating leaves will be really lovely with a glaze that flows in and pours in areas making some of the green part really very dark. You see I've made some spare leaves. That's because I always make spare pieces to try out glazes on before I glaze my final piece just in case I don't like it. It is a green man. I don't suppose you have to do it green. You could make it autumnal, so it could be done in browns. You could use oxides. Um, all of these green men can look quite different, quite individual, and certainly with glazes on that uh, are different, um, we should have, by the end of this isolation, quite a few interesting, different green men. However, let's take it a little bit further let's raise the bar again if you're going to work on faces um, why not stretch what you can do i made a different sculpture inspired by working on faces and and this is my lady version i'm not sure what color she's going to be I think blues, maybe blues and purples, maybe purples and pinks. She could be my ice lady. She's got a fly in a patterned um, headdress and was really good fun to make. And I suppose it's more uh, close to a face than the green man is. So hopefully, between the two, you'll come up with something of your own. I'm very excited about seeing what you can produce and I look forward to showing you these when they're fired and glazed. Just a thought though, when I was um, thinking about creating the Green Man, um, I came across this poem and I think it's really poignant at this moment. It's called The Green Man and it's written by Lauren Rain. And it says, remember me, try to remember. I'm that laughing man with eyes like leaves. When do you think that winter will never end? When you think that winter will never end, I will come. You will feel my breath, a vine caress in your foot. I am the blue eye of a crocus opening in the snow. A trickle of water, a calling bird, a shaft of light amongst the trees. You will hear me singing among the green groves of memory and the shining leaves of tomorrow. I will come with daisies in my hand and will dance amongst the sycamores once more. I look forward to sitting in our field with all my students and I look forward to us all being together again. Have fun. Bye bye.